morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ventura County Master Gardener Speakers Series. This talk is one of a series of virtual talks we have planned until we can resume our in-person meetings around the county. Today's presentation, Plant Propagation from Seeds, it was supposed to be about cuttings, but it's going to be about seeds today, will be about an hour with time for questions, but we will ask that everybody please stay muted due to the number of people on the call. If you have a question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we will get to as many as possible. Our speaker today is Harry Lee, who has been a master gardener since 2013. He says he has two favorite pastimes, growing plants and volunteering. Among his many master gardener roles, he has served as lead at the University of California Hansen Agricultural Research and Extension Center, where tomatoes, California natives, and other vegetables have been propagated for plant sales and public presentations. Today, Harry will talk to us about how to grow your summer vegetables and flowers from seeds. This presentation will include information on seed selection, planting media and soil, and what you can start early indoors and how to avoid some common pitfalls in growing from seed. We have several upcoming Zoom classes and a succulent wreath class coming in the next few months. Please check out our website and Facebook page for more information and registration. Please see these addresses in the chat box, as well as our email address for the Master Gardener Helpline, which will answer all of your gardening questions by email. Again, everyone, please stay muted and use the chat box for any questions. Harry, now over to you. Okay. Everybody hear me? Good. Oh, sorry, let me, let me not send that. Good morning. And I do apologize for removing the portion that was supposed to be dedicated to cuttings, but this is going to run <laughs> this is a little bit long, I'm afraid. So something had to go, and <clears throat> this morning it was cuttings. Um, I expect we will add that class in the in the future. Um, propagation is a fairly popular topic, and we certainly have a number of individuals that can provide that <clears throat> class. Excuse me. So anyway, let's get started with seeds this morning. Um, I need to share my screen. Oops, Nicole. Yes. Are we seeing the right screen? Uh, yes, we are. Okay. All right. <clears throat> we begin each presentation with a, a little rundown on the Asian citrus psyllid, um, commonly referred to as ACP. And Harry, before you continue, sorry, it looks like yes. you're in presenter mode. So we're seeing a side by side. I don't know oh, if there's all a right. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. I am sorry here. I would think you would want to go to slideshow, right? I'm sorry, I shared the wrong screen is my problem. Oh shoot. It's okay. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try to reshare this and share the right screen. There we go. So what you should see is the slideshow now? Nicole? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. All right. There we Actually, go. Actually, let's let's start with 
almost missed the helpline and all that confusion. If you don't get anything else out of today, for those of you who are not a master gardener, the helpline. Um, it's probably the very best resource we provide you. Um, it's especially valuable now when we can't see you so much in person. And on the screen, you should see the phone number and the email address. Um, you can't, as you usually can, drop off samples and that sort of thing. But they are there to answer all of your gardening questions. And it is well worth the email. Um, I highly recommend them. I use them to answer my questions. <laughs> Sometimes they even give me the answers I want. Okay, now we'll get back to the ACP. Um, the Asian citrus psyllid is a very small insect. Um, you can see the adult here. It's about an eighth of an inch long. Um, the nymphs are actually a little easier to see um, because of that waxy tendril that they produce as they feed. Uh, you can find them on your citrus. We hope you don't, but you can find them on your citrus. Usually in the, in the new flush, they will feed um, when, um, when, the, when the new growth comes out on the tree. And that's where you wanna be concentrating your search for the psyllid. Um, why do we care about them? Well, they are the vector for Wonglong Bing. It's a citrus killing, a citrus tree killing disease that is now present in California, has been since about 2012. The reason we bring it up with home gardeners is because in California it is still really, in, for all intents and purposes, found only on backyard citrus trees. Um, it has been found in about 2,100 trees in Southern California, most of it below Ventura County. Um, there's no cure for the disease. It will kill the tree in something like three to five years. There's lots of good research out there on the horizon, but until we have a, have a real cure, um, our commercial citrus industry is at risk. So it's really pretty important that we regularly inspect our citrus trees, that we look for, again, the nymphs are a little easier to see. We look for that for the insect. If you have the insect, the website that's listed on the slideshow is the best place to start. You can find the current phone number, contact them. Somebody will come out and look at your tree um, in terms of a, of a professional. If necessary, they'll take samples and um, you'll find out whether or not you really have the psyllid present. Um, in terms of control, there are things that you can do. And again, if you visit that website, they'll help you out. One of the things you want to try to do is make sure that you keep the ants out of your citrus, um, out of all fruit trees, really. Um, because they will um, actually protect insects like the psyllid or aphid from natural predators and make it much easier for populations to become established. So keep an eye out for the psyllids, keep an eye out for the little, the little pesky protectors, the ants. And if you think you found one, that website will give you the information that you need to contact um, state officials concerning um, having the tree inspected. And it is really important. We, again, the psyllid and the, and the disease came to California through a backyard uh, um, 
backyard cutting. And it is now still moving its way around Southern California in backyard citrus. It's estimated about one out of every two Southern Californians have a citrus tree in their yard. Um, one last thing, don't move, don't take the chance, don't move budwood, cuttings, grafts, trees, keep the citrus where it's at. Okay. And again, most of what we cover this morning, pretty much everything we cover this morning is going to be about seeds. I just couldn't squeeze it in. So we'll see about more classes on other types of propagation. What do we grow from seed? Why, why, why? Besides the fact that it is fun, um, it's a major pastime for me. If you grow from seed, you can have a greater selection of varieties. Um, you, you just have more choices. Uh, you're not dependent on your local nursery as, as good a place as that local nursery is. Um, they won't have everything that you can get from any one of the <clears throat> dozens of, of uh, seed suppliers that you can find on the internet. Um, you can grow what you need. Uh, it's, you know, if you've got room for three broccoli plants, you can grow four or five in a six pack from seed in case a couple don't survive and you've got exactly what you need. You're not either buying a $3 plant or several $3 plants or a, a six pack at the, at the nursery with plants that you don't need. Um, <clears throat> and again, I, I have a number of favorite local nurseries, but I am absolutely convinced the only time that I've had either of the mosaic viruses in my garden is because they came home from, uh, from the local nursery to my garden. I think that I can raise better quality plants than I'm going to get from the nursery. Um, they have a supplier, it comes in, it sits on their shelf until someone purchases it. Purchases it. it may have a little too much root mass, a little root bound, generally not good for a vegetable. Um, again, the nurseries are great places, but I think I can do a little bit better uh, most of the time if I'm growing them from seed. Um, I have better control over my planting schedule. Um, it's, my garden is still in the, in, <laughs> it's certainly still in the winter stage and will probably be for another oh, good two, maybe three months. Um, I can start my summer vegetables in mid-March or depending on how warm it looks out there, a little, even a little bit later than that. Um, I'm not dependent upon purchasing my tomatoes when they arrive at the nursery or the big box store in um, mid-February. There are tomatoes at the Home Depot around the corner from my house right now. I think it's a little early. Um, you do have a potentially lower cost. I honestly can't say that I do um, because of <laughs> the way that I collect seeds, but um, it is a possibility. And the last one again, I just think it's a lot of fun. It's another gardening activity. And it's especially nice on those rainy days when you can't be out in the garden itself. We're gonna go over a couple of terms, uh, try to keep this short, uh, but uh, if you're new to seeds um, or purchasing seeds, this, is, this part is kind of important. Um, You'll hear a lot about heirlooms. Um, you'll hear a lot about 
hybrids. Um, I was looking at some stuff just in the last couple of days. And to me, the term hybrid is, is almost universally misused out there in the um, seed houses in, in the purveyors of seed on the internet. Uh, it's not hard to find somebody who will sell you uh, organic seed uh, that probably qualifies for, for the general accepted definition of an heirloom in the vegetable world. And, and today we'll talk, I'll, I'll tend to talk more about vegetables um, just because that's most of what I grow. Um, but the same things apply to, well, flowers and to California natives or, or climate appropriate plants also. Um, at any rate, a hybrid is nothing but the combination of two plants, parents. We're hybrids in a big sense of the word. Um, people have been farming for something around 10,000 years now, give or take a millennia or two. And either on purpose or for the last couple hundred years uh, with some actual intention, um, we've been hybridizing plants. It's just, it's just what nature does. Um, it is the process of evolution. And it, in, in and of itself, can't be bad. Um, it, it's all plants are hybrids, including heirlooms. Um, they just are. Um, what people are usually, in a negative sense, usually referring to hybrids as are actually F1 hybrids. It's a term you'll see in seed catalogs a lot. Uh, it's the first generation of a seed cross. And we grow them because they very often provide a number of desirable traits, especially in disease resistance, um, but they tend to be more vigorous in growth and, um, and can provide some, some real benefits. Um, not everybody wants to grow those. If you're setting up your seed stock for for the end of the world, F1s are probably not where you want to go because they don't, uh, that second generation, collecting the seeds from, from uh, an, uh, an F1 hybrid plant isn't really a good idea. It, it takes years to stabilize a cross and um, what you get that, that second year, that F2, is probably not going to be anything like what you're going to get or what you got with that that first generation, either in disease resistance or um, whatever other characteristics you might be looking for. Um, heirlooms. Heirlooms are a seed with history. Um, it, it really is a term that should be used for, for the seeds you're growing that, that uh, your great grandmother grew in the old country or something along those lines. Um, it's got a fairly common definition in just time. Um, heirlooms are, are seed that, that um, existed around about the end of World War II. My real problem here is that there are a whole bunch of breeders out there, especially in the world of tomatoes, but tomatoes, peppers, uh, lots of lots of plants. You see more in tomatoes and peppers. They're just more popular. Um, they've been crossing um, varieties by what I would call the traditional methods uh, for six or eight or 10 years, and they have a nice stable cross, and they, they put that on the market. They have, there's a grower up in, in um, Napa County. Um, he's got some of my very favorite varieties of, of uh, tomatoes. Um, they're really pretty. They grow well. They're 
they've got good flavor, all those things that you want out of a backyard tomato. Um, they're not hybrids because he's only been doing it about 15 years. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very good tomato we shouldn't leave out. Um, the choice is up to you. If you don't want to grow F1 hybrids, they're pretty easy to avoid. You, you find dozens and dozens and dozens of suppliers on the internet that will uh, commit to only heirloom vegetables, flowers. Um, it's, it's, they're just not hard to find. If you want, uh, as I do, a little more protection from powdery mildew, for an example, um, F1 hybrids are probably the way to go. Um, my sweet corn tastes better than, I think, and stays on the stays on the stock a lot longer than, bless you, Nicole. Thank you, than, I'm sorry. <laughs> than, um, than what they were growing 20 or 30 years ago. Um, it's, it's just a, a more family friendly uh, variety. But the choice is absolutely up to you. Harry, and, we have yes. a question. Yes. Before you go on, sure. would you, the question is, would you recommend a when to plant chart for the Ventura County area? We have one. Um, I, I didn't stick it in the slideshow um, because it did not fit. We have one. I hate to put this on the helpline. I'm not sure how we would distribute it, but. Um, you know, um, I can um, find the link because I, I have a link to it and I can put it in the chat box. Okay. I will do, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I, and it's a, it's a very good one. We've been using it for, for years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, with the exception of what you might experience in your microclimate, it's, um, it's a very good guide. So sooner or later, we'll have that in the chat box. Um, OK, I have a couple of definitions. I'm not going to read them. Um, but again, you're going to see everybody, um, every seed purveyor <laughs> is going to make a statement about GMO, uh, whether you have a, a maybe a somewhat older, but I think better definition in number one, or you subscribe to um, the definition that I've listed as number two there. Again, the choice is absolutely yours. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, um, well, especially with number two, you can't buy uh, as a backyard gardener, you cannot buy um, a, a a seed that fits definition number one there. It's just not possible. Um, but if you don't want to even go so far as to, um, well, for example, my sweet corn wouldn't pass the test on, on, on number two there. Um, choice is yours. Everybody, every seed catalog I think I've seen in the last 10 years makes a statement about GMOs um, and hopefully gives you enough information so that you, they have defined how they are looking at it. There is a website uh, for the Safe Seed Pledge. And again, not all um, seed houses, but a good number of them will tell you whether or not they've signed on to the Safe Seed Pledge. Um, you really shouldn't have a lot of trouble uh, finding seeds that fit your preferences in terms of um, whether they've been more laboratory produced or open pollinated. Um, it's a hot topic. Again, you shouldn't have any trouble finding um, 
the information that you need about um, whoever's trying to sell you seed. If they're not talking about it, find a different provider. Um, seed life. If you're going to buy seeds, you're going to have them left over. Um, and if you take good care of them, you can have them left over for years. If you keep seed in a cool, dry, out of direct sunlight sort of place, and I actually use a, a sort of little refrigerator you find in a dorm room. I don't remember my dorm room anymore, but I'm sure it had a little refrigerator in there that, that would have been perfect for saving seeds. Um, the big thing is to keep them dry and try to limit the temperature temperature variation. And as in all things gardening, I know there's a bunch of you out there that have been keeping seeds in a box in the garage and the, and the temperature will, will be 60 degrees one day. A few months later in the middle of the summer, it'll hit 90 or 100 degrees and your seed grow just fine. That's true. Um, but if you take good care of them, all of us as a group, will have better luck meeting these, these standards. If your carrot seeds get to be four or five years old, you probably want to buy a new package of carrot seeds. They don't always do so well when they get a little bit older. You not only lose germination capability, but then the plant's not particularly vigorous, even if it does germinate. OK, we're, we, we got to get Um. And again, if you're, if you're planting from seed, you've got those extras, sooner or later, you're gonna wonder, or not, wonder whether or not they're any good. Here's a couple of methods for testing that. If it's a large seed, like a pea or a bean, the bowl of water works pretty well. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. Um, if you have a smaller seed, like the carrots, I just mentioned, or you know, it doesn't matter, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Um, use the damp paper towel. Don't squeeze all the air out of the bag, the, the Ziploc bag. Um, and you probably want to try to keep them a little bit warmer in that paper towel to make sure that they germinate. If you get a good germination rate, then you've got good seed. If they don't germinate very well, it's time to buy a new package of seeds. Okay, let me make sure, oh, good. Okay, now let's talk about actually planting seeds. Tools. The, the, the um, little sticks there in the middle of the, of the uh, slideshow here, in the middle of the slide, probably look a whole lot like chopsticks. And that's because they are. Um, I have a box full of chopsticks. They make the perfect um, dibble, if you will, which is just a device for making a small indentation in a, in a plug tray or a two or three inch pot, whatever you're gonna grow your seeds. And we'll talk about growing or uh, uh, containers in a moment. Um, so if you, if you want to plant vegetable and flower seeds, start collecting chopsticks. They, they really are just about the perfect tool. You can, with a little, you can measure it, a little pencil. Uh, planting depth is real important. So you can mark off the um, depth as a guide on them. You don't use them for very long be, because they um, you can't really wash them or clean them. But they're usually free and they're readily available. Um, and I, they're just, well, I really do have a box of them. Um, you've got little trays for holding the seeds or cups for holding the seeds. 
my favorite tool, um, which is kind of like a little mini spade, uh, used to be available from Lee Valley Tools, but they stopped selling them a couple of years ago. And they're a little bit hard to come from, come by, excuse me. But if you look on Amazon or some similar sort of site and look at bead sorting equipment, you can get both the little trays and something that'll get you pretty close to this. And I don't know what people who deal with beads use them for, but they work pretty well for seeds. When you plant, you need to know as much as possible about what you're planting. Um, if the seed company has done a good job, they've put a, essentially all of that information on the seed package. Depth, um, germination rate, spacing, all of that stuff can be found on the package. It's, it's worth knowing, it's worth following their advice, especially with depth. The most common mistake I see people make in, in the face-to-face -face classes is always depth. They'll either put it too, you know, make it too shallow or more often um, their half an inch becomes an inch and a half and that little seed just doesn't have the energy to pop its way up out of the ground and it won't germinate. Um, if you're going to make a mistake, make it on the shallow end, not the deep end. Um, there are solutions to planting a seed too close to the surface for, for most seed. Um, there really isn't much of a solution if you've, if you've put your um, uh, seed that should be at a half an inch at the bottom of a three inch pot. It just won't grow. Use a seed starting mix if you can. It's going to be finer. Uh, uh, it starts out for the most part uh, sterile, sterile or at least clean. I would generally not recommend uh, garden soil uh, in a, in a, in a for starting seeds, it's it's not going to work nearly as well as if you use a seed starting mix. Almost everything that you can grow outdoors, you can grow indoors. Um, some of the large um, seeds, like beans and peas, uh, peas because they're they're viney, and and unless you're really organized, much more organized than I am, you can't. Um, uh, you'll have trouble with the with them as they grow. Um, beans are very sensitive to light in my experience. Um, so I generally plant those directly in the garden. Um, carrots and radishes, uh, most root crops. Uh, other root crops will do okay. Carrots and radishes just don't. Um, they need to be direct sown or I would suggest that they need to be direct sown. Uh, you're not going to find it very often, but um, if you grow um, more unusual flowers or California natives or something along those lines, um, there may, you may need to pre-treat the seeds. Uh, it can be just soaking them in water, warm water. You know, we'll try to get to a little bit more of that in a bit. Um, uh, sweet peas, the flower. Uh, if you scar the surface, you get, you'll get a much, uh, well, both faster and um, a better germination rate uh, if they, if, if you carefully score the surface of that sweet pea. That allows the water to get in a little bit faster than having it have to soak its way through. What do we plant in? Whatever you got. Um, I have used egg cartons. I don't anymore. Um, strawberry baskets work pretty well. Uh, they make, um, I think there's another slide coming up. They make a device for making paper pots um, you can get. It doesn't matter. 
as long as it's clean. Um, at a minimum, wash it with soap and water. Uh, if you uh, can, either hydrogen peroxide or um, household bleach will work. You want it to be as clean as possible. You really don't want to, especially if you're reusing the container. If you've got an egg carton, you're going to use it once or a paper cup. Paper cups work pretty well. You're going to use them once and you're done. It's it's a little, uh, cleanliness is, is a, maybe a little less important. If you have a six pack or some recycled um, um, plastic pots, a plug tray, if you have a plug tray, you're, you're all set. You're going to reuse them. They need to be clean. Um, otherwise, you're going to, it, it, it's simply a matter of time before you're overwhelmed by a mold or fungus or damping off or some other thing that you really don't want to experience. So, Sorry. Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of questions. Okay, let's go for questions. Can we use only coconut peat for starting plants? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I see why not. I, I feel a little bit better answering yes for sure if I saw it, um, but they do make the, what I call core. I don't, I'm not sure I ever pronounced it correctly, but the, the uh, a lot of people are trying to move away from peat because of its environmental impact and the coconut um, fiber, uh, processed co coconut fiber is, or core is, um, is often used instead of peat. And, and if you look at the, I'm going to jump ahead a slide. If you look at the, the white stuff in here is perlite. Um, the planting media itself could be coconut or peat or there's probably even some other stuff that, that people are trying out there. Um, there's not a lot of nutrients in a, in a planting you know, I'm sorry, the starting the seed starting um, media. Um, you don't need it. The seed has everything that it needs to grow. And so you, you, you don't fertilize, you don't um, enrich the planting media in, in any way when you're seeds, when you're starting seeds. Um, so the fact that there's a lot of not a lot of nutrients in the in the coconut fiber isn't going to impact anything. It's how finely ground it is, I would think. That's going to be important. Okay. Another question: um, Would you talk about soil blockers for seed starting? Um, you know, I've never used one. Um, it's a long, long time ago. I, I'm sorry. I did have, if I understand the question. I did have one of these little devices where you wrap the, um, at that time I used newsprint, um, around, it was just a, um, a, a wooden block, um, cir circular block. Uh, but I've never used an actual, what I assume we're talking about, a, a device to produce a block of planting media. Um, so I'm not sure I have an opinion. Um, <laughs> okay. It's, it's, um, that's a good one. Another I, question about sure. uh, 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 soil. How is seeding soil different than regular soil or dirt? Dirt's what you sweep out of your house. So we never talk about dirt. Um, um, the seed starting mix is really exactly the same ingredients as, as the stuff that I use to transplant it into before it goes to the garden itself. Um, and that's a, it's a peat perlite combination for me or, or sometimes I've, I've used the coconut fiber stuff also. 
the only difference from a good uh, potting mix, even that you'd put in your in your raised beds, and the seed starting mix is how finely it's ground. Um, it, it's it, you can if we were doing this class face to face, I had a handful of of each to show you. You you could each instantly tell which one was for seeds because it's just so much more finely ground. Um, it lacks almost all nutrients. Um, there's, there's, um, there's just nothing there because again, the seed doesn't need it. The seed has what it needs to grow. And in fact, um, there are uh, some plants, seeds that, that um, respond in the negative to soil that's too enriched. You'd actually reduce your germination rates if you fertilized them in advance of uh, propagation. Um, so it lacks fertilizer and it's more finely ground is really the, the, the big difference. The ingredients tend to be exactly the same otherwise. Okay. Um, I don't think, yep. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna make a negative comment about peat pots. Um, again, long time ago, um, I used to use a lot of them. I don't use them at all, at all anymore. Um, they don't break down very well in my garden. I, I just, um, if I had a, if I'm growing a lot of plants that whose root mass was especially sensitive, sunflowers um, can be kind of temperamental about being moved. A peat pot might make sense to me then, um, but they just don't, um, they just don't break down very well for me anymore, if they ever did. Now I just notice. Um, and so I'm not real fond of them, but I certainly know lots of people who use them. And again, if I, if I, in doing my research, found a, that the plant root mass is very sensitive to being moved, a peat pot would be a good answer there. Um, otherwise, I really tend to, whoops, sorry. I really tend to go with the, um, with these. And if you're not, uh, most of us either have or have a neighbor that has um, it, the endless plastic pots from the local nursery. Um, <laughs> six packs are incredibly good. And if, um, again, if you wash them, uh, they'll last a two, three, four planting sessions before they finally crack and break. They're not hard to collect. Um, they're free, so they're pretty inexpensive. And um, they're a very good container for starting seeds in. Couple uh, more questions, Harry. Yeah, go ahead. Two more questions. Sure. At what point does the seedling need nutrients? Ah, we will get to that one. Basically okay. when you're when it has true leaves, when you're transplanting it. Okay. Um, and and another, another question. I'm sure. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, sunflowers, what is the best way to start seeding a sunflower? Um, I sort of ignore the fact that their roots are a little more sensitive. I honestly have not had a lot of trouble and I, I use a, a large version of a large cell version of, of a plug tray. Um, you, what you might want to do, um, if you can get a three or four inch pot and put um, two or three sunflowers seeds in a, in a well, four inch pot. Um, I've had very good success with them that way. Um, I haven't found them to be quite as temperamental as as some of the 
some of my research would indicate. Uh, I would not put them in a in a little one by one cell or one even a even a peat pot, the tiny little peat pots. Um, but anything larger uh, should work pretty well. And if you're taking it out, just well, you always want to be careful with the roots. Be especially careful with the sunflower. Okay. Um, real quickly, label everything. Um, if you are only growing tomatoes in your four six packs on your on your patio, I suppose labels aren't, and they're all the same variety. I suppose labels are not important. In every other situation, they are. Um, I think you'll find it well worthwhile um, if you put a date um, and, a, and the name of the plant. And if you're talking about um, vegetables, a variety can help. Um, but at least that date and, and the name of the plant. The date's going to help you if the seeds aren't germinating um, as well as they should, or to keep you from poking at them if if you know it's reached day four and they really need seven to ten days, leave them alone. Um, label everything, and labels are easy to come by. You'll see some more a little bit later, um, a couple slides down the road here. Um, they're easy to come by on Amazon. They're not terribly expensive. You can get the rigid um, uh, or more flexible labels. Um, you can get them in colors. They're they're pretty available. Handle the seeds as little as you can. Uh, I tend to wear the plastic gloves. Uh, it's you're just you're just avoiding contamination. Um, it's it's probably a small thing, um, yeah, but it might be worth doing. Um, we will talk about light. I hope. Um, and, but if you get a, a plant, I had some, even though they're out on the back patio, our patio is pretty shady here in Santa Cruz. My, some of my Brussels sprouts on one edge of the plug tray got pretty leggy. They were well, probably a good two and a half inches long before they, before they had leaves. They're not worth saving. If you're not talking about a tomato, um, start over. Tomatoes, because you you plant them a little differently anyway, can survive the legginess um, a lot better than most uh, any other vegetable. Um, I find beans reason I another reason to direct sow beans is I find them to be especially sensitive to light, and so if you're not really careful with your beans. Um, you may end up with something that's not going to grow very well in your garden. I give up, start over. Seeds are cheap. It's a good learning experience. Um, and they just won't do well. Harry, what do you mean by leggy? Um, I'm not sure that I can give you a precise measurement, but basically you're looking at, at well, I don't know, um, a plant that's, well, if your plug tray or four inch pot or whatever has a, a seedling that is leaning over because it's got this nice long stem, that's leggy and it's not gonna do well in the garden. Um, again, unless it's a tomato, because then you can stick all that, that stem um, in the ground anyway. Um, the, the, the tomato will love it. It's, I kind of want to say it's one of those things you'll, you'll know it when you see it. I really did have, it had to be a good two inches long um, on some of my Brussels sprouts um, because they just, I just left them too long before rotating the tray. Um, and it not only didn't stand straight up, it 
really did lean over quite a ways. Um, it was more of a loop than a plant. So I pulled them out and, and we'll have a few less Brussels sprouts than we should have. Um, if you're growing from seed, you're, you, I mean, one of the advantages is to protect them from the elements. So they're probably not sitting out on your um, picnic table in the backyard. You need light. Um, you need to be able to water them. Um, you can see trays here. Um, this nice kit, if you will, which again, if you're of a mind, uh, these are pretty available on Amazon, this whole sort of setup. Um, the, the dome is, is certainly optional. It's, it's designed to keep the, um, uh, keep the humidity up, um, maybe necessary, maybe not. Don't let the media dry out. Um, if your seed starts to sprout and then can't get the water that it needs, you're going to start over anyway. It, it's just not going to grow. Um, you want to provide a lot of light. I, I, I like this picture up here because it there's nothing with, with, with nothing there. It's nice and bright. Um, if you start with something like this or use something like this, keep keep in mind the idea of rotating whatever um, container you're using. Uh, if it if it's not a single plant, um, you know, taking one of these and turning them around, literally just turning them around, can keep those plants from um, suffering a, a lack of of light. And you want Harry, the lights pretty close. Yes. Do you have to have an artificial light? No. If you have enough sunlight, I mean, I, I've. I, I know one person anyway that does pretty well with a couple of six packs on a bay kitchen window. Okay. Uh, it, it's it it certainly works. If you're not rotating that, um, if you're using natural sunlight outdoors, um, you've probably got um, predation problems to worry about. You've got birds or bugs that are going to be um, after your tiny little seedlings. So you have to worry about that. But the sunlight itself, of course, is perfect. Um, okay. Heat's a problem. If it's, if it's June, um, that's that, you know, you could have too much sunlight, not because of the sunlight's bad, but because the heat is and burn the you'll burn the little seedlings in the winter time this time um it was it wasn't too bad it's about 45 here last night um under ideal circumstances that's a little cooler than you want your seedlings a lot cooler actually so doing it out outdoors is is a challenge but if you can provide the the um, protection from predators and the um and keep them warm direct sunlight works um, artificial light and seeds sort of go together, but there are no requirements other than you give it a try. Um, LEDs or fluorescence, it doesn't matter. I still use flu fluorescence because they still work. I haven't had any reason to replace them yet. And um, mine are all T5s, which are the tiny little bulbs. Um, grow lights, LEDs are just fine. Whatever you get, you want a full spectrum fixture. You want a, or a bulb. Fixtures don't really matter. Um, if you have old, uh, what they used to call uh, shop lights, larger fluorescents, they work just as well too. The T5s are just cheaper um, and um, <clears throat> More energy efficient, LEDs, of course, being the most in energy efficient overall, um, but still more expensive. Um, 
But anyway, you want a full spectrum light. It's if you really get into this and you want to do the red light, blue light um, stuff, um, you know, you change the bulbs at a given point, um, or you're raising a particular type of, of uh, plant that has a special um, light needs. Some plants won't germinate if they are exposed to light. Some plants require it. Um, uh, onions, you, onions for the size of the seed, you plant pretty deeply because they don't, uh, uh, they don't respond well. They don't germinate as well when exposed to light. So you're planting an onion seed um, an inch deep when given the size of the seed, you typically be doing it more like a quarter of an inch, half an inch. And that's because it will do better in terms of germination in the dark. That, inch down. Harry? Yes. What is the optimal temperature? We're talking about light temperature or are we talking I about temperature, believe temperature so. of the soil? It uh, says what is the optimal? I imagine because we're talking about light, maybe it's about that. Um, I honestly don't remember what red, the, the red portion of the spectrum runs at. The blue portion of the spectrum is, I think, five to 6,500, 5,000 to 6,500, if we're talking about light temperature. If we're talking about soil temperature, um, uh, and we will talk about heat, let's go to heating mats now. Um, again, I'm sorry. I, uh, well, and I think I look at light a little bit like I look at fertilizer. If I'm giving advice, um, if you just get a full spectrum light, then you don't have to you don't have to worry quite so much about the details, at least until you become um, you know, really involved in, in either growing specific types of plants or you want to experiment with um, uh, running, um, if I get it right, red light for um, the red portion of the spectrum for germination. And I'm sorry, it's the other way around. I, I've forgotten now. Um, but there are people who will, <laughs> especially growing the, the um, plant of choice these days, um, that'll run either red or blue lights in sequence because um, red, red, I guess, is for uh, vegetative growth. Um, if we're talking about soil temperatures, I would set my heating mats at probably mm, 70, 75 at a minimum and no higher than 80. Um, most seeds will germinate faster and at a higher percentage if they are warm and they'll grow um, better, uh, faster if they're warm. Uh, there's a ton of research out there that says it's a good idea, even for winter vegetables. Um, I used to only deal with it in the summer, but this year, um, well, last couple of years anyway, I've also kept my winter vegetables on a heating mat. Um, I may have just spent a few hundred dollars of your money if you really went out and bought all of this stuff, but individually, they, they're not terribly expensive. Um, $25, $35 on Amazon. Uh, get a mat that's the same size. Well, get a mat the size of what you need. Um, these. Trays here are called 1020 trays, and they make mats that fit the tray. Um, it's roughly 20 inches long and 10 inches across. Uh, if there are more seed questions, we're lighting, planting, anything like that. Uh, there is okay. a question about watering. Okay. Um, is it best to provide water from the top or from the bottom? Well, Judy's here. I'm not going to say that that I always water from the bottom, but because um, I think she always waters from the top. I, I don't think it matters a lot. Um, I, honestly, I do both. I, um, when I've got a plug tray like this um, on a heating mat, um, I will use just a regular old spray bottle a lot. Um, and 
because it, it won't dry out evenly. Um, okay. And so there are cells that that you know might be on the edge, might be um, you know the plant might be growing a little faster, whatever reason there it needs more water than than the little cell next to it. Um, so I really will do both. Um, and I, I don't I don't think it matters um, a lot um, for seed starting. Uh, all of these, when I use a plug tray like this, there's a tray underneath it. And I will very often leave a couple of cells in a corner, you know, like a like there or you know, it doesn't matter, any corner, a corner that that I can reach. Uh, and I don't I don't put any planting media in there. And um, I actually pour the water in there. Um, so I'm not messing with the tray quite so much. Um, okay, so, but don't let them dry out. Whatever, whether it's top or bottom, don't let them dry out. Um, so you've planted them, they've come up, they look like this. Um, it was a great success. It's time to transplant. You want to transplant when you see that. What I'm going to say is this for the non-master gardeners out there, the second set of leaves, the first true leaves, the plant will lose, eventually lose those, the, the first leaves you see when it comes up out of the ground. Um, that second set of leaves means it's time to I don't know, <laughs> trying to draw a comparison to my grandkids, but um, it's, it's ready to grow. It's ready to be a real plant. And it's time to think about fertilizing. It's certainly time to think about transplanting it. It's probably filling or has filled up that um, cell unless you put it in a good size four inch pot. And then you probably still have some room, but uh, it, it's, it's ready to go. And it's certainly ready to, um, it, it's, Resources are exhausted in the seed. It's ready to be fertilized. Um, it may not be ready for the garden, but it is ready to leave um, a, a small container if you use something like this. Again, a four inch pot transplant may not be as necessary. Um, if you do use a smaller container first, um, egg carton, uh, egg carton probably, well, may not go directly to the garden. <clears throat> I probably wouldn't. I'd probably put it in a four inch pot um, and let them get pretty good size before they go out to the actual garden. Um, you wanna, if you move it, you wanna be as careful as possible with the root mass. You wanna, you want that root mass intact. Um, you want this, when you do it, Transplants, you want the soil, I'm sorry, the planting media to be moist. Again, not, not wet, but moist so that it does hold together. Um, if, you're, if you're handling it as you transplant it from a smaller container to a larger container, try to handle it by the leaves, not so much by the stem. If you crack or break or crush the stem, um, the, the plant's not going to grow. Um, <laughs> it just becomes, I don't know, something for the compost pile or your bunny rabbit or whatever. Um, so if you're planting out of small containers, and again, back here, you can just see the plug tray. And let me point out before we go any further, this is too dry. Um, this is not what I would recommend. If you're, uh, what you really want, you want your planting media to be moist when you put it in the larger containers. This was being done indoors with my grandkids. So it is dry on purpose. Um, it's hard enough to clean up um, dry. Uh, peat and perlite. Uh, when it's wet, it's 
it's a real mess. So you've you've got a bunch of these guys like this, and maybe it's just a, a couple of six packs, but you end up with two in your um, in your plug. You can use the scissors and cut one off so that you leave the other one to grow. That works. I don't really recommend that you just pull them apart. I do, honestly, but it's not really a great idea. Um, or you can get yourself one of these, a little glass jar of water. And carefully by the leaves, just dip it in the water, up and down motion. And you're going to wash off most of that soil. And then the two plants are going to be separate and they can go into their own larger container. Um, after you've done the transplants, you want to water them again, even though those, the um, media was wet. You want the root, you want to make sure that the roots are in, just like you're putting in the garden, you want to make sure that the roots are in good contact with the planting media, with the soil. And then you want to fertilize. Any good fertilizer will work. Um, and a, a seedling, a transplant seedling is no different than a plant in the garden. You've got to keep an eye on it um, for uh, signs of nutrient deficiencies, but, a, you know, you're looking at fertilizing it once or twice, probably while it's, it's still in the transplant stage. And the reason I picked this, one other thing, especially if you're doing your, your seed starting outdoors, you can see the material over these transplants and it's available at, um, um, it, it's a netting. Oh, there's a sewing term for it. Tool. Thank you. Tool. I use it yards and yards of stuff, and I couldn't. All of a sudden, I couldn't remember what it's called. Thank you. Um, it's it's perfect. It's it's a great gardening tool. Um, if you're covering the transplants as they sit outside, getting used to being outside. I mean, if you have birds. Um, even small rodents, the tool or netting, uh, again, available at any good um, uh, fabric store sort of place. Um, I, I highly recommend it. It's inexpensive. Uh, I don't think I've ever paid more than a buck and a half a yard for it. Um, and quite often, I think less. Um, But I want you to see it if, again. If you're going to do your your seed starting outdoors, I would get um, a yard or two of the tool, and um, it'll it'll do a pretty good job of keeping most things out of your seed starts. More I have questions? A question, a question, Harry. Yeah. At the transplant stage, are they no longer on a heat mat? If it's too cold outside. If I were if I were putting up um, squash or tomatoes or peppers, peppers are absolutely the best example. If I were putting up peppers today, um, because I just couldn't resist seeding a plug tray last last month, I probably would keep them on a heat mat. Um, because they, they're not going to do well, you know, it, it depends on the, on the climate in your garden. And, and it's, it's a little warmer, uh, a little earlier in the year in, um, Ventura County than it is, you know, I spend an awful lot of time in Santa Cruz County now. Um, up here, it's just not going to be warm enough, um, until May, at least May, I hope in May, um, I would keep them on the heat mat. There's, okay. there's no no reason 
not to just keep an eye on the water. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Sure. Um, this person started a raised garden box on February 7th and thinks they may have started too soon. Is there <laughs> anything they can do to help the plants germinate? And they live in Rancho Cucamonga, zone 9B. Um, well, if this, I, I would, I would go back to my seed pack, and if the if the seeds aren't up a week or ten days, because I think you have time, a week or ten days after the seed pack says they should be up, I would assume they're not going to come up. If they've come up and they're just not growing very quickly. Um, patience is what you've got. There's no real rule that says you can't plant um, a tomato seed today uh, or last month. <clears throat> and it'll come up, or pepper. Again, peppers are maybe even a better example. The pepper will come up out of the ground very slowly and you'll, you'll probably get a lower germination rate if they were direct seeded. Um, it's, not, it's not going to, it's not gonna die. It's just not gonna grow very, very quickly and it's not gonna set fruit. If I plant mine on a nice warm late April day um, and you planted yours in February, for the most part, we're probably gonna get fruit about the same time. You might be a little bit ahead of me but um, it's peppers and tomatoes depend on nighttime temperatures and, and daytime temperatures. They need that heat to really do what we want them to do, which is set fruit. Um, so um, but if, if they've germinated, you're, you're fine. Just keep an eye on them. If they haven't germinated, go back to the either the internet or the seed package if, if you have it. And if it says germination should have been within 14 days and it's been 21, I'd begin to think about starting over. Okay, another question. And I don't know if we can really speak to this. Um, the, the person is asking about uh, on Toronto, Ontario. Is window light the same as being outdoors? And how do you acclimatize, acclimatize to the sun? Or how do you acclimatize to the sun? Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Your climate's a lot colder than ours. Um, the only problem you're going to have on your, well, assuming it's a nice double pane window and <laughs> And we're not talking about about um, any any cold shock. Um, the only thing you you need to be worried about is the rotation of that um, uh, you know whatever you've got the seeds in. Uh, the sunlight coming through most window glass is going to be exactly the the same. And I don't know that tinting would make any difference. We're not talking about we're not talking about any part of the UV um, uh, portion of the spectrum. It's it's really the red and you want more red and blue and we don't care about the white and less yellow and green is my understanding of the spectrum as far as germinating plants. Um, so your window glass isn't gonna make any difference at all. Um, and in terms of actually, uh, introducing them to the outdoors is exactly the same. The timing may be different, but um, when I take the transplants out from from um, from indoors to outdoors, uh, I try to worry about them on on rainy days, <clears throat> and then they start out in shade, either artificial because I provide it, or if the, if you have a shady spot. I'd give them some. Uh, I'd give them a few days um, out of direct sunlight. Um, even, yeah, well, uh, anywhere from 
two or three days to maybe a, a, a week um, out of direct sunlight and then introduce them to the sun itself. And that process should be exactly the same for us as it would be in Toronto or anywhere else. Um, okay. Temperature, I would think, would be the would be the only issue. But again, if you don't rotate that, if that container is indoors in a window, if you don't rotate it, um, the plants on the inside of the, are going to are not going to get enough sunlight, and they're going to they're going to have that problem of too long of a stem that we talked about. Anything else? I don't have any other questions in the chat box, but if everybody, if you, what I did put in the chat box are our next two Zoom classes, Growing Summer Vegetables and All About Tomatoes in the next two months. So uh, please go to our website to register for those. And it's in the chat box. Any other questions? I'm gonna, um, is there a chart available for temperature requirements for a variety of seeds, Harry? Um. Uh, specifically, not that not that I know of. Um, temperature is usually dealt with in in um, general terms, unless you're talking about um, stratification, which is the process of of, of breaking dormancy. Um, there are seeds that that require, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that require um, either heating or cooling, um, and sometimes both. Um, the um, narrow leaf milkweed that our monarchs like, actually they don't like them so much, I, I learned, but anyway, we've grown a lot of, of narrow leaf milkweed, um, California native, native to Ventura County, uh, and it actually requires prefers will germinate better if it is um, in, um, if you wet it, cool it, and then warm it up. Um, not particularly, in that case, not particularly high, just you know, room temperature 70, 80 degrees, but you'll get a much better germination rate if you go through that circular process. Um, there are lots of seeds, again, natives that require um, higher temperatures that you know you might leave them in an open oven for a couple of hours or you might soak them in warm water in the 160 180 degree range um, the general temperature for seeds or seed starting i would say is more like 70 to 80 degrees um, um, there are lots of specific stratification issues that you face with, with um, natives or uh, you know, the, the, the more unusual uh, seeds. And that information I've always had to collect. I, I don't, um, I have, I have a, one of the things I couldn't figure out how to get in the slideshow was the bibliography. I, you know, I've got, two dozen uh, propagation books and they'll have little tidbits here and there on stuff, but um, I'm not aware of anything consolidated. I have two more questions, Harry. Sure. Um, for seeds that are in the ground, do roly polies eat the seeds or the roots or only the sprouts usually? Uh, I don't think they Sound eat bugs? the yeah, sow bugs. Yeah, they're really. Um, I don't think they eat the. Uh, I don't think they eat the seeds. Um, I think your major uh, predator for seeds are birds. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they are amazing. They're amazingly good at eating my carrot seeds. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the. 
no, I, I think I think uh, sow bugs will will chew on seedlings like crazy, along with earwigs, another uh, big predator. Um, but I I don't think you'll have any problems with the seeds them, themselves. Okay, I have another question. Um, what are your favorite seed sources? <laughs> uh, the master gardener asked that question. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I don't think uh, she's the master gardener. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. Uh, there 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 are some rules about um, about us uh, specifically recommending um, a, a a product or a vendor, you know, a seed source. Uh, I will I will recommend. Um, I have a, again something I couldn't I couldn't get on a slide. It just didn't fit. Um, I have always gotten away with just giving you a giant list of of seed houses because I do frequent them quite a bit. Or you know if I haven't bought from them this year, I bought from them last year, kind of thing. Um, they're um, they're not hard to find and. And if you spend a little bit of time, um, there, there is a website, uh, Dave's Garden, and he, he's not selling anything, so I think I'm okay. Um, they maintain a database on um, various um, uh, garden vendors, including seed houses. So if you go to Dave's Garden, you can look at their at what people have said about any any number of places that uh, sell seed, uh, and you read read through a few of the reviews, and especially I, I always try to read the ones that, that people are complaining about. You know, if they've gotten five stars, clearly they're happy. I don't need to know anything else. But if you've given somebody a single star, then you know why. And a lot of times it's the shipping. Um, one of my favorite. Uh, places, one of the places where we order uh, for the program a lot, um, uh, just because of their variety, uh, we have we have the need for the heirlooms and the more F1 type seeds um, in different parts of the program. We certainly are not monolithic in our approach to what type of seed we are willing to use. But at any rate, so we, we use this particular place. And, and quite often I see when folks are complaining, it's over their shipping cost. Um, and that is something worth paying attention to because it varies a lot. Um, so. Is it okay to buy seeds from a nursery rather than online? Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I did, certainly didn't mean to slight either uh, 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 local nurseries. I, you know, I do it more by brand. Um, I'm more likely to buy anything garden related at a nursery rather than one of the big box stores. I, I just won't get plants there, period, uh, which is maybe unfair because I bet you they get the plants from the same place that our local nurseries do these days. <laughs> That's just the way of the world. Um, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And most of them, um, if you walk into I think both of the big box stores in Ventura County, you will see uh, uh, on the, um, they, they very often have uh, um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to describe it without giving, without giving you the name. Um, they very often will have the, um, one of the seed vendors that I, that I like um, that deals a lot with, uh, uh, with in this case, heirloom vegetables. Um, and you, you see some of the, the, you know, the big old time names um, uh, there also, and again, nothing wrong with them. Um, there is one I got to mention. Um, it, it's actually up here in Santa Cruz. Um, but for, if you're starting out in the seeds, seed starting world, um, the only vendor I have ever seen that, 
that does this is a place called Renee's in Felton, California. Find them on the internet. You can find them usually at the local nursery there in Ventura County. Find them all over the place. Find her all over the place. Um, and she's the only uh, seed house that I've ever seen that packages seeds, um, multiple varieties in the same package so that you can order three, you can order one package of beans and get three different kinds. And, and um, you know, she's been doing it for 20, 25 years anyway, because that's how long I've been um, <laughs> buying those packages from her because you don't need 50 um, of the same variety, probably don't want 50 of the same variety, but to get 15 or 10 or 15 of three different varieties of you know, bush beans, pole beans, whatever, <clears throat> can be real handy for the home gardener. And again, I have never seen anybody else but her do that. Um, and she's easily available either uh, on the shelf at, at um, Green Thumb or, or um, oops, <laughs> on the shelf at the local nursery or- That's okay, it's okay, Harry. Yeah, or- uh, <laughs> Um, uh, on the internet. I wrote the name out on in the chat box, the, the correct spelling of Renee's. It's Renee's Garden. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fountain's a little town between here and San Jose, more or less. Okay. I don't see any more questions, Harry. All right. Well, there's always the helpline. Don't forget yep. them. They do a wonderful job and they can answer all these questions. And if they don't know the answer, they know where to find us. Find me. All righty. Be sure to sign up for our next couple of classes. And we'll see about adding the cuttings. I just, as you can yep. see, we went way over um, already and even that I even with that I left out a, a chunk on purpose today. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll see about getting more propagation classes for you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Harry.